Noise Brunell, and thank you all for joining our sewing circle today, which is a part of the Black Mountain Bloom Seed Lending Library. We are so pleased to have our local Buncombe County Master Gardener, Mary Alice Ramsey here today to talk about planning your vegetable garden. In conjunction with Mary Alice's talk today, please do stop by the seed library table, which is nestled in the Black Mountain Library. And so you can pick up your seeds. We still have flowers and herbs and veggie seeds ready for you to take home. Um, I also received uh, from Southern Exposure Seed Exchange yesterday, um, some more seeds. So we have uh, Mountain Princess tomatoes. We have a wick line cherry tomato. We've got some more oak leaf lettuce and we've got some Cosmos. Everybody could use more Cosmos in your garden. So mm -hmm. down to the library and I'll be putting more of an inventory up in the boxes. Now, for a few housekeeping notes before we start, um, our next Sewing Circle Workshop will be about 10 easy vegetables to grow with Clint DeWitt. And it will be on May 1st at 10 a.m. And this will be continued on Zoom. Um, now also, please go to your library because we've got an amazing amount of gardening books there ready for you to check out. And if you're a member of the Seed Library, you're automatically enrolled to possibly win a free gardening book and the winner will be announced each month in our monthly newsletter. We're always looking for seed donations, so please bring some by uh, to the Black Mountain Library and just drop them off at the counter. Now, about the presentation, everybody is on mute. So if you've got uh, a question, just go ahead and type it in that chat box. Mary Alice will be taking questions halfway through the presentation and then at the end. We'll be recording this presentation and it will be put up on the library's YouTube channel. And once that's available, I'll send that link to you. Um, yesterday, I mailed out a handout for everybody. And so it just gives you an outline of what Mary Alice is gonna be talking about today. So you can jot down your notes. So I am so pleased to introduce my friend, Mary Alice Ramsey. Mm -hmm. Mary Alice is a WNC native and a graduate of UNC Asheville and Western Carolina University. She is a retired art teacher and she's a writer and a studio artist. She became an extension master gardener volunteer in 2015. Her garden has been visited and enjoyed through several garden tours and it has been featured in Southern Living Magazine. So let's all welcome Mary Alice. Take it away, Mary Alice. Okay, I am Mary Alice High, and I love vegetable gardening. Um, there's so many great things about it, the planting, the growth of vegetables in your garden, the harvesting, but one of the most exciting things about gardening itself is the actual planning process of your vegetable garden. Um, as we begin this time together, um, let me mention that I want to talk to you about the structure of the presentation. I'll give you a quick overview and then we're going to get started with the slides. So as Lyndall mentioned just a moment ago, um, we're going to we're going to look at about half of the slides and we'll pause for questions. We'll watch the second half. I'm going to share information. We'll pause for questions and then I have some follow up slides at the end. Um, I would like to tell you also just a couple of things about myself. As Lyndall mentioned, I am a Western North Carolina native. I was born in Haywood County and have lived in Buncombe County since I was preschool. And as I was growing up, there was always a garden, but it was not for show or for enjoyment. We grew our food because we, we needed that food to put on the table. We ate from the garden in the summer. We preserved the food and enjoyed that during the winter. So it was just a way of life. And so I have continued with that for my entire life. And it's just a great source of enjoyment for me personally. Um, when, a lot of times when I start a class, I will ask people to raise their hands 
And, you know, how many people are natives? And I'll, I'll see a few hands. How many people moved to Asheville, maybe, or the area, um, you know, Western North Carolina, maybe 10 years ago, and there'll be several hands. But generally, many people are new to this area, and we're so glad you're here. So we're going to get going with our um, presentation here. And as we begin, uh, you know, you might ask yourself, why plan a garden? Because the fact is, if you go out and, you know, buy a few tomatoes or seedlings and put them in the ground, you're probably going to have a, some produce from that. But if you plan, you're really going to have much better production when you take into consideration the location and the sun. We're going to be talking about those things and water. We'll continue with that in just a moment. But by planning, and considering the environment and what you plant, there will be much more long-term enjoyment with your garden. Besides the fact, as we go along with this, you will realize, as I do, that the planning process is actually quite fun. Uh, and in between each information slide here, I have um, just uh, slides from my garden. And by the way, I think with the exception of two slides, all of these photos are from my garden. In the front here, you'll see um, squash plants growing. You see a couple little blossoms in there. Um, on the left, if you look to the extreme side there, you'll see um, a structure and strings for pole beans. And of course, the scarecrow. Actually, we have two scarecrows, one in the foreground and the background. On the right, you'll see some tomatoes and marigolds. And you'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that structure in the far back right. We have a bean house, which is a lot of fun. It's just a, um, built for pole beans to climb. But anyway, so we're going to continue to think here about planning. One of the most important parts of planning is to choose or select a site for your garden. You know, seeds or plants are going to need soil, they need water, but they especially need sunlight. Um, you, there are many vegetables that will do well with like six hours. Eight to 10 hours is really better. So sunlight is essential in choosing where you're going to plant things. Um, it's best to have them away from buildings and trees because those things do cast shade. Uh, my garden, which is kind of at the far end of my backyard, uh, used to have lots of sun and now my neighbor's trees have grown a little taller and I don't have quite as much sun. So that's certainly a consideration. Drainage, which we might not be in the forefront of our minds, is also really important. Um, higher ground will escape light freezes one of which we had just a week and a half ago. It was actually kind of a hard freeze. And we're not out of the woods yet with that in the mountains of North Carolina. But um, do take into consideration the drainage um, within your garden area. Um, this photo shows borage, which is a, a really an herb. I planted this in my garden uh, for the first time two or three years ago. One of the reasons I planted borage was because it's a great pollinator plant. But it's also blue, and I just love having blue in my garden. As you select a site, also really important is your water source. And you got to have some water coming from somewhere. Um, it's great to have it near a faucet, but, you know, uh, a hose is great, sometimes a sprinkler. And as we back up and think about a hose, um, you can certainly use a traditional hose, a drip hose is, is a great idea, but if you're considering a sprinkler, um, some plants, tomatoes specifically, but a number of plants do not do well and to, to wet the whole plant depending on the time of day, so it, it's really better to water at the base of the plant. Depending on the size of your garden, a watering can or a bucket may do the job, but definitely think about the, the water source. Um, I didn't really refer earlier to the outline that you received. I think um, Lyndall did mention that, but, um, you know, Phil, I, I hope you'll take notes if, if you uh, pulled up that handout ahead of time. These tomatoes are uh, from the garden. 
and you will see this um, a little bit more in further slides, but notice that there's a stake or a post there in the middle of the garden and the tomato cage is actually around the post, which, you know, is just a method that we've chosen. Notice also that there are two different kinds of tomatoes here, two different kinds of vines. Um, I tend to plant two tomatoes in each, at each post. Um, it just, it, it has worked for me over the years. There does need to be enough room for air circulation there to prevent disease, however. A really fun part of planning is selecting your vegetables. And you know what it comes right down to when you think about well, what am I gonna plant? You choose what you love. You choose what you want to eat, what your family would enjoy. Um, and, and also, as you do this, you take into consideration what will grow in this area. Um, there are some things like watermelons and cantaloupes. Occasionally people have <clears throat> some luck with them around here, but they are generally grown a little farther south. Um, so there are a few vegetables that don't grow quite as well in the mountains, but, but you can grow so much here and you choose what you love to eat. Um, we talked a moment ago about sunlight. Some vegetables are more tolerant of shade. Uh, for example, cabbage. Now, I don't grow it in the shade, but I do place it sort of at the back of the garden because it does well where it has limited sun. A really important thing to think about also as you start out is the space that your plant is going to take up. You know, it took me a few tries as a gardener to actually think my cabbage is actually going to get that big. So if I don't leave enough space, it's not going to do well. Um, many vegetables, you know, as you plant them, it's, well, it's just really important. Read the instructions on the back of the packet as far as the spacing, and then just take that into consideration as you place your plants. Um, crop rotation is something to think about also. It's important not to plant the same plants in the same space for year after year. Um, and that is true too for plants that are in the same family. Um, but the, the reason we take that into consideration is it, if you plant the same plant for a long period of time, uh, insects, it tends to foster insects and diseases. Insects can, depending on the plant, they'll lay eggs in the ground or in the uh, mulch on the ground. And, you know, they can have generations of insects year after year, or also some plants deplete the soil of nutrients in one spot and need to be rotated to another. So just as you select your vegetables, think about the placing of them. That's a consideration. Um, here's some carrots from a few years ago. These are, I've just washed them off and they're laid on a newspaper on my kitchen counter, but those are from my garden. Carrots are fun and they're good. Um, one of the cool things that, and we're going to talk more about this, I'll actually show you the piece of paper in a moment, is to draw a diagram of your garden. Um, the, and the reason I'm showing the outdoor pictures here before I actually show the process of drawing is if I were thinking about using an area of my yard for a garden, whether it had been used previously and I wanted to just straighten it up or expand it a little bit, or whether um, it's a place that had never been used as a garden previously, you can get out there this time of year and walk it off. You measure the space, you stake the corners and decide where, you know, you might have this garden. I mentioned on here also that gardens are not always square. Now, when you look at the image on the left, it looks like, well, that's kind of square or rectangular. It's actually currently an L-shaped garden, but there is an area just to the left of those um, PVC pipe hoops that go across the blueberry bushes in the back. That's actually a triangular area too. So, you know, gardens can be different shapes and sizes. The slide on the right shows my husband, Terry. This was at a point that we had an established garden, but we're expanding it onto a different part of the yard. And after we had walked it off and staked it off and decided what size the raised beds were going to be, and mine happened to be four by 11, but he marked off the ground there. And so you can see what's happening with that. 
um, this is that corner area of the garden. And I just used it a few year, a few times year after year to put my sort of leftover perennials in. And so in the middle of the summer, it's just, well, it's beautiful, but it attracts pollinators and it's, um, it's I, I love that little corner. Um, speaking of pollinators, and you'll see this as the slides continue, um, having bees and butterflies, a lot of native bees, little beetles is so important to the environment in the garden because they pollinate those plants. Um, as you think about how you're going to structure your garden, think about whether you want to have rows, which is more of a traditional method and a very good gardening method, or raised beds, or you can consider a combination. Um, on the left-hand side, um, you see a picture of Swiss chard, and that's inside a raised bed. And then occasionally, you'll see from the example on the right, um, I plant rows inside the raised beds. <laughs> that was a bit unusual. This is an autumn garden. And I think those were turnips and they have they were just coming up and have not yet been thinned. Some very small seeds can be planted close and then you thin them out as, as you go. And depending on that plant, sometimes you can just eat the greens. Okay, here's some sunflowers from the garden. I love sunflowers. I love all flowers. And here we go. Once you have looked around in the yard, you may have pasted off, possibly even marked off the corners. Then there's where the trusty pencil and paper comes in. Um, here I've used graph paper, but you can use notebook paper, use any paper and just, you know, draw. It, it's nice to do it to scale. It doesn't have to be exactly to scale, but um, you consider possibilities. Um, of you know what you want to grow and where are you going to put it like I say that does get rotated from time to time although you know when you plan notice in the front that I have a fence in the front of my garden right now and um, those perennials are in there now they can be moved but but that's that's a consideration when you consider these possibilities this is a picture of that my garden in the winter. <laughs> it's probably, well, it's, it actually is a winter picture. Um, and you can see some of those uh, not so desirable winter weeds on the ground, but you do see the tomato stakes in place that I just leave out year round. In the back is a compost bin. Um, we've had for a few years, and I'll talk to you more about that a little bit later, and there's a garden shed. Notice also, this kind of interesting, I'm saying raised beds, you can look at these beds and it's like, hmm, those are not raised a lot. Because we're on a slope, the upper end of our beds is almost flush with the ground. And then the lower end is, you know, sort of a foot or more tall or high. The far end of the garden where we've added the beds in more recent years is even, they're even taller because it's a greater slope. But anyway, that's a winter picture. Okay, and I, I guess I'm repeating myself here, but when you're drawing that diagram, don't forget the perennials because the flowers in that is the a perennial is a flower that'll grow back from year to year. They attract pollinators and there you can see a butterfly. But you know, one of the wonderful things about gardening itself is that gardeners live a life that's closer to nature. We uh, provide a habitat for pollinators and for garden creatures. Sometimes they're wanted, sometimes they're unwanted. But, you know, as you garden, you will find that the garden provides nutrition for you, but the garden also just nourishes your soul. <laughs> so I love it. There's a honeybee. And I do, I don't have honeybee hives, but I do have some honeybees in the garden. Some places they're more abundant than others. Also very important to consider with gardening is the soil quality. And the fact is, especially if you're starting a new garden, you may be dealing with red clay. Um, and what we're aiming for is more fertile soil. Now, what I did not realize until I became a master gardener, actually, and by the way, a master gardener is someone who has taken some classes and met some state cert, you know, has received a state certification 
Um, it doesn't mean we know everything. <laughs> it means we know how to look it up and we know a little bit, but um, there is a class open. There's, there's ad, there are ads right now that there will be a class in the fall for people who'd like to be certified to be master gardeners. But um, right here, while I was talking about soil quality, um, much of our soil is red clay, but what I didn't realize until I was a master gardener is that red clay soil has many very valuable nutrients. It's just that the molecules are such that they tend to pack down too hard for there to be healthy roots with plants. So what we do as gardeners is add organic matter. And we're talking about compost, excuse me, shredded leaves, manure, um, great times to add those are in the spring and the fall. It, from my experience, if you're dealing with soil that's not in great shape, it really takes about three years to build it up and to really get it to a rich, loamy um, condition. So be a little patient with that, um, but, but the soil quality can definitely be improved. Green manure is a great idea. The photos here show cover crops. That's things that can be planted in the fall and they kind of grow throughout the winter and they're cut down in the springtime and they add nutrients to the soil. Here's the compost bins. There are actually three sections. Um, in one section, I throw weeds from the garden and that is weeds that have not yet gone to seed, but weeds, grass clipping, decayed leaves, that sort of thing. These are turned into the second compost bin. So it's almost like year one, year two, and year three, because by the third year of being mixed and turned, you have really great, dark, rich garden soil. And oh, and by the way, you know, it may, it may seem like, oh, wow, what a great compost post to be my husband. I just brag on him here and built that, uh, built this bin. But for a long time, my compost was a pile of compost on the ground. And I am a very laid back composter, as in I do turn the compost, but not really often. And it just does its thing. It does its trick and it's a wonderful process. Um, as far as fertilizing is concerned, the best thing to do is know what your soil needs. And the way you can do that is by uh, using a soil test. Those are available at Black Mountain Library. Uh, they are available at the Extension Office for Master Gardeners. But it's a good idea to do a, a soil test every three years. And actually, I would say multiple soil tests. And what that means is, especially if your garden's a medium size, you might want to get a bit of soil from one area and then from another area of your garden because sometimes it's not the same in throughout the entire garden. Um, it's a, a six or 6.5 pH is ideal for garden soil. And it's possible you may need to add lime or fertilizer uh, to your garden. If you are starting right now and you, well, well, let me back up and say, you can generally process a soil kit you'll get the results back within a week or two so probably you have plenty of time to do that if you haven't tested your soil and want and you feel like you probably need fertilizer something like an 888 or a 10 10 10 is is a general medium probable good choice um, ways to add that are to broadcast it if you haven't added your plants yet you can just kind of spread it out using you know with your hands in garden gloves you can just spread it out by hand over your planting area. You can also band it, like add it beside a road that's already established so it, the rain takes it in, the nutrients into the roots of your plants, or you can side dress individual plants, just add it beside. And we're about halfway through our slides right now. So I think, um, Lyndall. Yeah, Mary Alice, we do have some questions for you. Uh, Andrea, uh, they are building raised beds two feet tall. Uh, what right. do you recommend for filling these beds initially and then replenishing in the in the future? Um, uh, there there are differing opinions about what to put in the beds. Um, definitely composted soil. You can purchase 
topsoil. Manure is a, you know, manure is a good idea. And when I say manure, you can purchase manure that's sterile, that has nutrients. If you acquire the manure, like from, if you know of somebody who has a dairy farm or raises rabbits, and I have used rabbit manure, added it to my compost to put in my beds, that is a great addition, but it's important if you actually acquire manure from a farm to be sure that it is aged, uh, depending on what animal it's coming from. So that's a consideration. But one thing that I have learned that is essential or it's certainly good and cheap or free to add also is definitely mix in native soil. Mix, especially if you, if you have that red clay mix it back in with the garden, with the, um, well, and I, I started to say potting soil. I actually did a little research on this recently and some recommendations say to do a mix of potting soil with manure, with compost. But like I said, add some of that native soil in also. And the second part of that question was what, did you add the second or how didn't, I'm sorry. Could you repeat well, the second she, part? Yeah, she wanted to know if um, you'd be re, she'd be replenishing the soil in the future. You know, oh, with, well, probably not. I mean, let me, uh, you don't really have to, certainly don't have to replace it. I find that when I've filled a, um, a raised bed, it kind of, it looks like nice and full and fluffy and then it sort of sinks a little bit and after a year or two it's down a few inches so yes but hopefully by then you have made some soil from your compost pile and you just in the fall especially mix that in with the soil and let me mention also this is not really addressed in our presentation here as far as the slides are concerned but many people like to garden with a no-till method um, I personally do till, like now we till to start with, to break up the soil, but I have a little mantis tiller, which is like a miniature tiller. And so I do till. And so I mix in compost in the spring and the fall. So okay. maybe that helps. She had an additional question of wanting to know if you've ever done huga culture in a raised bed. Huga culture? Yeah, that's. Uh, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> okay, that I'm probably not going to um, explain this well enough, but what I believe it is, is like when you have like wood or um, when you chop up trees and stuff and you can just lay it on top of the ground and then, or excuse me, you kind of dig it into the soil and then it breaks down over time. I and just, I have, I have not tried that. I'm so sorry. And, you know, I am, I can, <laughs> we might come up with another question I can't answer too. I don't know, but I really don't know. I don't know. Okay. Well, fair enough. Um, now we've got a question from Kimberly. Uh, where should I put her compost? She should put it in the sun or the shade close or away from the house. Um. <laughs> Do you know there's there are multiple answers uh, that are correct? Uh, you put it wherever you can. <laughs> um, I mine is in the shade and it works fine. Um, I think and what I have read, what I've heard previously is either sun or shade works okay as far as the decomposition of those materials. Um, the good thing with having your compost close to the house is if you want to put kitchen scraps in it. And I'm talking about vegetable scraps, never meat scraps. But if you want to put vegetable scraps in it, it's nice to have it closer to the house. Um, but it's also really important to have it close to the garden. My compost is pretty far away from my house. I think it's much more important to have it close to your garden. Because that way, when you weed, assuming those weeds have not gone to seed, you just, you know, toss them in or you gather them up into a bucket and dump them in you know, and you will tend to add to it more if it's close to your garden. So there. All right, well, we've got two more questions. Uh, another okay. one, Kimberly, she wants to know what the difference is between compost and fertilizer. Um, well, compost is, a, is um, mulched up and decaying organic matter. Uh, compost is basically 
leaves and plants that are rotting or decaying down uh, the process and the nutrients from them combine to become soil. I mean, it breaks down into soil. That is compost. Fertilizer is like this bag is showing us right here is chemical. And that chemical doesn't mean bad. It's just nutrients from the soil that have been analyzed chemically and you know, can be added. Fertilizer is generally commercial. Compost is generally natural. Okay, thank you. And the last question is from Heather. She wants to know if it's okay to put wood ash from the fire pit in your compost. Um, what, now I'm speaking from what I have read recently and what I have heard. So I hope I'm, and <laughs> Linda will be, be a, Feel free to connect to correct me if I'm wrong here. I would say yes in moderation. Um, it's uh, the it would be too concentrated if you added too much. Uh, old timers, and I'm talking about years ago, just that was one of their fertilizers that they added to the garden. It helps uh, uh, balance the pH in the garden. However, um, you know, too much would not be a good idea. Um, it also depends on what you've burned in your uh, fire pit, but a, lo a lot of wood right now is free of chemicals that would be dangerous, but sometimes you don't really know, you know, what's in that fire. I mean, it depends on what you burned in the fire pit. Yeah, I think that's in, in, mo in moderation. Yeah, right. Everything's always in moderation. Definitely. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to. Go ahead, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, okay, as you begin a garden, and I wish, see, right now, I know you can see me, but I can't see you <laughs> because I would ask you if I could see you um, how many people were completely starting gardening for the first time and, you know, uh, whether you are an old hand at this. But garden tools are very essential to a garden. If you're going to have to go out and buy new things, then you're going to need a shovel. You're going to need, need a rake. You're going to need a hoe. Um, definitely a trowel. I use a trowel a lot. Um, but just basic tools. It doesn't have to be anything elaborate. Um, as I mentioned, I do use a miniature tiller, which has just, I, we only use it a couple of times a year, but it's great. Um, notice in the photo, you see a broom. Now, that broom is fantastic in a garden, <laughs> um, especially when we have tilled and it'll, the tiller throws a little bit of dirt on the edges of the raised beds. These are the lower raised beds you're looking at on the right, right there. Um, but, you know, I use it to clean up the garden sometimes. But when a broom gets too old for the house and then it becomes too old for the garage, then it graduates and is promoted to being the gardening broom. The gardening broom. So I, I love the garden broom. Um, on the right, this is a photo of me that my husband took unbeknownst to me through a window in the garden shed and I'm using the tiller. So there I am in all my glory, garden tools. Uh, this is a photo from inside our greenhouse, which we've had for about 15 years. And there's a little harvest there that I've just brought in from the garden and I paused in the greenhouse. Um, also consideration with garden tools, you need a wheelbarrow or a wagon or something that you can haul uh, weeds and mulch and that sort of thing. You're gonna need to move things from time to time. Um, I have not used a spreader or fertilizer, it's, but, um, but a wheelbarrow is a good idea. And they're not super expensive, um, depending on what you're looking for. And you can sometimes find them at yard sales too. Okay, this is a, a wheelbarrow full of some stuff we've chipped up and getting ready for compost or pathways. You know, this sounds so simple and incidental, but especially if you're starting a garden, we are talking about planning here. Don't forget things like a measuring tape or, or something to measure your area with. A kneeling pad is a great idea. A hat, a gloves, and don't forget the sunscreen. Uh, this uh, slide shows, uh, well, the edge of a raised bed. 
um, the perennials there, the Rudbeckia, that's the black-eyed Susans, they're a part of that triangular part of the garden I mentioned to you. And bless their hearts, those little ferns just grow by themselves. And what that tells you is this part of the garden is, it has too much shade, <laughs> but the blueberries do well there. And um, as do perennials, as you can see, and some of the vegetables. So that area is not getting quite as much sun as I want it to. Garden structures are some of my favorite things. <laughs> um, and well, let me back up and say, structures are really important depending on what you're gonna grow. Some things like squash, uh, you know, you don't need structures for those. They just kind of, the plant bushes out, the leaves stay upright and, or they, you know, or support themselves, you're in great shape. But with other things like tomatoes, and if you're growing pole beans or, cucumbers, some kind of structure is necessary. The purpose of this, of course, is to keep the plant up off the ground and it keeps the harvest, well, it keeps the plant healthier, it keeps the vegetables cleaner, the formation of the vegetable is better. On the left, you're seeing our tomato cages. You gotta look kind of close to see them. They are, each stake has a cage around it. Those are in place. You can also see some within those, uh, within that slide on the left, it's close to some perennials. There's some onions growing there and some marigolds. And I think there's basil in between also, but on the right, um, there is a, there is an exist, well, we added the fence just a few years ago, but where a fence exists already, you can sometimes use that as a structure for your garden. Um, we fenced probably a third of the garden, a fourth of the garden a few years ago, because we were having a real problem with rabbits and they would just eat down the little bean shoots, eat down. And so we got ambitious and built and it's hard to actually see the fence, not the one of the extreme right, the wooden fence, but there is a wire fence. But the thing is in the lower right, you see the gate of the fence. So it's, it, you, you can kind of tell it's there. But because I had pole beans growing on the right, pole beans growing on the left, which means, you know, these tall beans that would grow up um, strings that I add to the posts, it was almost like a garden room. So just to make it more fun, because I think the garden should be fun, we, and that's my husband Terry and I, constructed, he actually did most of it, um, the metal pipe that the window frames are hanging off of. And now those window frames make it sort of like a garden room out there in the summertime, but that's also a trellis for sunflowers to grow against or for beans to grow into. Um, in the kind of center back, you'll see a structure of something called a bean house. Um, I visited someone's farm uh, about six or seven years ago, and they had a teepee with beans growing on it, constructed out of cane poles. It was so big that children could go inside this teepee, and I thought, how cool is that? So, and I thought, if you can have a teepee, you can go inside. Why not a house? So, once again, <laughs> my genius husband constructed this little structure that looks like the outline of a house, and then every spring I put strings on it. We plant pole beans and it creates a house. It's like a tunnel that you can walk into and pick the beans and the grandchildren can play in it. And it's just fun. Notice also that it's fastened to the edges of a raised bed. So I think it's in its probably third location now, but every three years we move that bean house. So it just to, you know, for more nutrients from the soil. Um, these cabbages have a little uh, PVC pipe uh, hoop over them and I covered it with bird netting just to keep the butterflies off so uh, have healthy cabbages. Um, also uh, considering garden structures, um, well this is just this shows you a little bit more from a distance. Oh see the bean house on the right has the beans growing across the top, the pole beans on the left you can see the beans growing up. And this photo was probably taken in July because the, those black-eyed Susan, see the Rudbeckia, the yellow flowers back there are looking good. Uh, there are perennials in front of the fence also. And those scarecrows actually do scare the crows. So cool. 
Um, oh, and the scarecrow also. <laughs> I'm using him here as a garden structure. That's a moonflower. But um, he, he, while he's standing guard there, we just sometimes let plants grow right up him. So there we go. Um, trellises are really good for cucumbers and beans and peas. Oh, I, I didn't, wasn't thinking earlier about peas. Notice in the lower right hand corner, you'll see um, it's a window frame. It's an old yard sale or flea market window frame. And you'll see a picture of this later with cucumbers growing on it. You know, just turned sideways, staked down into the ground. The uh, left hand photo shows the bean house. And if you look closely there, you can see the beans growing inside. We just added the little stained glass pieces for fun. Um, and then you'll also see the, um, I guess this is probably a June garden in the upper right. You can see the pole beans just a third of the way up the strings there, the squasher are coming along. And one of the scarecrows. Here are, this, this is part of the bean house. And you can see the little beans just starting to climb the string. Um, gardening in itself is exciting. If your garden is inviting to you, you will tend to spend more time there. And that, that is important, you know, to keep the weeds at bay and to keep check on any insects that might be moving in. Uh, and I use window frame. I, I don't have a photo of teepees right here, but I do make teepees for cucumbers to climb up sometimes. But we did a a thing a few years ago, uh, we just uh, paint, because, again, I just like blue in the garden, but um, this is a chest of drawers. Oh, it's an old used chest of drawers that we painted blue and planted. And so that's one of our garden structures, as well as other little fun things. Strawberries don't need this, it, they just like it. Um, as you plan your garden, think about seeds and plant sources. Their Asheville has lots of, and I'm saying Asheville, I know folks might be joining or watching from other cities, but you will have probably many garden shops around to choose from. Certainly seed plants. It's getting a little late to order from catalogs for the spring because we're so cl close to planting. You know, seed catalogs are a great source. Apartment stores, get seed get seeds from friends. Um, some, many plants I plant from seeds, some I transplant, um, as in I do my little tomatoes. Um, uh, it, and when you look at those, double check them in the, if, you know, from the garden store, a medium height, not necessarily the tallest plant there. Of course, it needs to be green, but check for insects, uh, see if there seems to be a good root system minute. Neat idea if you can do it, plant on a cloudy day or in the evening because the sun can be hard on a new little transplant as well as wind. Okay and another thing and many of you may know this but tomato plants really benefit from being planted deep. If you buy a 10 foot tall, 10 foot tall, whoa no excuse me make that 10 inch tall <laughs> tomato plant you know, you may need to plant five or six inches of that into the ground simply because that stem will stand out little shoots and will grow roots and um, you'll have a taller, healthier plant in the long run. Same with peppers. Uh, this is a picture of actually some butterfly weed that I had grown from seed that I'm getting ready to transplant out into the garden. Okay, when you get seed packets, read the instructions on the packet. Um, it will tell you about the planting depth, which is usually three to four times the size of the seed. So tiny little seeds are not going to nearly larger. Those instructions and follow them. Listen, sort of. If you are doing gardening in raised beds, sometimes you can plant plants closer, depending on how big the plant's going to get, than you could if they were in rows. So, um, but anyway. Uh, check out the written instructions on the plants. Okay, here's a picture of some monarch butterfly caterpillars, um, which I'm just super experienced with. When you space your plants, 
um, consider whether in they're in rows, many plants even within a raised bed are planted in hills. You're, what you're seeing right here is squash plants. And I've planted multiple little areas within hills. And depending on whether all your seeds come up, you may need to thin those. So I use a modified square foot method. If you're going to do a square method, do read the book. Um, there's great information in the book, Square Foot Gardening by uh, Mel Bartholomew. Here are some monarchs that I just had to throw in the picture of there. I have uh, butterfly weed in my garden. It's one of the pollinators. And these guys have just hatched out and they're ready to fly. Take into consideration the weather. We're in zone seven, but in the mountains of Western North Carolina, zone seven can have different little ecosystems. So somebody a few yards from you might not be having frost, but you might. And early little plants sometimes need to be covered up. And I have used, you see flower pots here, you can use jugs or boxes, um, but only overnight. Um, because they would get too hot or wilt the next day if you leave the covering zone. Um, avoid midday sunny planting and realize that wind can damage your tender little plants. Here are some blossoms on some beans. It's important to keep records. Uh, and sometimes record keeping can just be in a really small notebook. It can be one you carry around with you or one you keep in your pocket. Um, keep note of your planting times, the names, what works well, what doesn't work well. I personally am a big journaler, like visual journal and garden journaler, but even basic notes are really important to keep. I do have a couple of um, dwarf trees in the garden. Here are some apples. These are references that I have used. Um, the Square Foot Gardening by Mel Bartholomew, and I also use the Master Gardener Training Manual. And we are going to pause right there for a moment but, and see if there are other questions. And then I have just a few more slides I can share. This, well, let me go ahead and mention this is where we were just starting the garden. So, and I'll tell you a little about that. But Lyndall, are there any more questions? Well, that's such a good segue because Andrea said that um, your garden is so beautiful and such an inspiration as we are starting from scratch. So that's a perfect picture to have on there. <laughs> what she yeah. can do. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. This is this is where we were starting. This is where we were starting from scratch. And when, we have been in our home for about 21 and a half years. And when we first came there, there had been a garden in the back of the yard. And you can see this is the back of the house, the back of the yard, but it wasn't quite as big as what we've tilled up there. And the soil was, well, the soil is bright. I mean, it's kind of red clay. It's not terrible, but it's, it's clay soil. Um, what we did to start with was measure it off, mark it off. Um, we, I work with pathways. So notice there are no raised beds, but there are no, I mean, there are no boxes that are built, but we did mark off beds. Now this is it's just what we chose to do. Till up that soil, start to enrich the soil, and we established pathways. But that was just, I mean, you don't have to have pathways. You can just have a place to walk between the rows, but we established pathways. But um, okay, what I would say also seriously is start small. Now this is a medium-sized garden or a medium-sized garden space you're seeing right here, but you know, Gardening can be overwhelming. Gardening that is just too much to deal with and goes to weeds can be discouraging. So, you know, start kind of small to medium. And um, I don't know, does that help? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, that's how we all do it because you don't want to right. be overwhelmed. Right. So, and have fun with it. That's the important part. Absolutely. I mean, you're always, always learning. Are there other questions? Yes, there are. Uh, Rance wants to know uh, what vegetables can you grow in a raised bed that's in the shade? Um, the, the, well, if it is completely in the shade, I mean, completely in the shade, I don't know of much you can grow. <laughs> if it's, if you get some partial sun, like I, cabbages do pretty well. And in the springtime, there are lots of things you can grow because the leaves are not on the trees. 
So you can grow peas, you can do lettuce, you can do spinach, you can do, you know, those, those early spring onions are, are pretty good too, but squash, corn, tomatoes, uh, cucumbers, those things need sun. So there are things you can grow in partial shade. Okay. Kimberly wanted to know is where is the greenhouse, your greenhouse located and is it necessary? Oh, it is absolutely not necessary, but um, you're looking at the back of our house here. It's, and on the right hand side, there's the garages, there are two garages, but the garage is not connected to the house. It's a separate building. And we just use the place we had available and it happens to be a Southern exposure which is not essential, but you know, we, you wouldn't want it blocked and it'd be a Northern exposure necessarily. Um, the greenhouse is just an absolute luxury and it's wonderful. Um, Terry built that from a kit from Van Wingerden. So he constructed it himself. And anyway, so no, the green, and there are lots of greenhouses like um, plastic greenhouses, smaller greenhouses, you know, modifications in bay windows, <laughs> greenhouses. So um, it's, it's, it's absolutely not necessary, but it's fun. It is fun. And she also wanted to know if you could make one uh, temporarily on a raised bed. Oh, uh, yes, absolutely. With just, we, well, for example, we use PVC pipe hoops that are fastened with screws to the inside of the raised bed to put bird netting over blueberries and that sort of thing. So you could certainly, using wood or PVC, a, a hoop of PVC pipe could, you know, put plastic over a raised bed. However, it's very important to have ventilation because you can just sort of burn things up in there. It gets really hot. Okay, and Julie wants to know, um, she's planting directly in the ground without raised beds. Um, do I need to completely dig the soil out and replace it or just break it up and add to it? I would say break it up and add to it, but it also depends on whether it's grass to start with or whether it's just kind of loose, you know, usable, tillable, uh, shovelable soil. Because if it's grass that and you just turn, if you just break up the grass and plant there, the grass is going to come back it's got like it's like weeds in your garden so if it's if there has been no garden there before I would seriously just with a shovel remove the grass break up the soil um if you if you can borrow or have access to a small or even medium-sized tiller I personally would till it I know there are different veins of thought about that that's what I would do and till in nutrients that start to enrich that soil but um no I, you don't you don't need to remove all the soil okay thank you now, add to it. beth wanted to know what are some good perennials and are there any that are edible um do you know uh, i started to say I, I don't edible perennials don't immediately come to mind but there probably are some i know some of the annuals <laughs> are edible like nasturtiums and and you know, there are a number of flowers that are edible, but um, Rudbeckia, that is Black Eyed Susan, is a great hardy sunshade perennial, is wonderful. Bee balm, uh, Echinacea is a wonderful perennial. Tall Phlox is a wonderful perennial. Um, those are the three that come to mind immediately, but there are a lot of from bulbs like Procosmia is great. It comes back year after year. There are dozens, dozens of perennials. Um, so yeah, and many of them are good sun to shade. Some, some like more sun, but some of them will take both. Um, Susan wanted to know if you've already started uh, for this season. I have, we have barely started for this season. And I'm saying we, a lot of times I do the tilling. Terry did it this year. This is the brag on Harry uh, presentation, but it's true. He did it for me this year. Um, I'm having some shoulder problems, but anyway, um, so we have prepared the soil. I have planted onions and that is it so far. Although there are crops that could have been planted. Uh, for example, this time of year, you can go ahead and do cabbages, spinach, peas, 
Uh, so there are cool weather crops, but we're barely, we've barely started this year. Um, somebody wanted to know if they can plant um, anything over a septic field. Um, as long as, um, generally septic fields are deep enough to where it wouldn't hurt to till um, over that. So I don't see a problem with it. I mean, I don't know. Maybe there's, you might want to check a more expert opinion about that. No, my first thought was, hey, that'd be a great place. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, lastly, Beth wanted to know, um, what's a good time to start potatoes? I have, I have planted potatoes in my garden since we've lived in Fairview, but not in several years because they require some significant space. Um, there are is advice that can be gained about that, but I don't want to tell you something that I'm not sure about. I would check with the people at Southern States or, or uh, there's, a gar there's a master gardener helpline you can call. I'm not sure. Um, Typically, start your potatoes around, um, uh, what's the holiday? Um, Mother's Day? March 15th or so. Yeah. Oh, March 15th. Okay. So like Easter. Yeah. I think you could still probably, or probably still in the window, you can probably pop them into the ground and you should be fine. But considering the weather outside, I think you should be okay. And we just had that discussion last month about potatoes too. I know our time is getting close. You might have a couple more questions. Do yeah, I have time to scroll? Just... Do I have time to, oh no, what did I do? Um, oh. No, no more questions, Marianne. Um, Beth okay. said, really, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. So go ahead and show you some more, show us some more pictures. Okay, this, these uh, are just photos I wanted to share. They won't take a really long time. This is where we had first put in raised beds. Actually, if I look at how weathered they look, maybe it's the second or third year we've had them in. But this is before we really expanded the garden. And we have used wood chips in pathways. Sometimes we actually purchase the, the mulch and sometimes it's chipped up with a wood chipper, um, but you can see raised beds there. Um, this is where we expanded the garden into the lower area. This is where we just cut the area right, you know, you can see the grass has been cut up out of the area that was marked off. The beds are on a hill, therefore they're taller on one end than they are on the other end. And we have, you know, broken the grass up and it hasn't been moved out yet completely. But when it's deep like that, we just left some of it in. Um, here's a springtime picture. Um, and you can see the, the garden, the structures in the garden there. And a fun thing, you know, to have in the garden is strawberries strawberries. Um, I've experimented with some berries and bushes. Uh, these beans are inside the greenhouse. And I tell you what, I try to pick the beans when they're young and tender. And then you get busy over the weekend. They're not quite ready on Thursday and you get busy on Friday. By Monday, it's like, oh, beans are too big almost. But anyway, you can see the beans there inside the bean house. There's another butterfly picture. Um, there's a little tomato harvest there there. I've just, and I don't harvest all the tomatoes at the same time, but I just happen to have several that day. You can see them there. I do interplant marigolds as well as, um, a number of other, um, uh, annuals in the garden. Uh, some sunflowers at the window frames, just using those as a trellis. Um, this is a little difficult to see, but there's a baker's rack that I also just is permanently in the garden, uh, just push down into the soil. And I use it a lot of times in the spring for peas and then I'll put uh, cherry tomatoes on it too. Um, you use whatever structure is there. <laughs> this birdhouse is at the top of a post and the beans are growing up on it. Birds don't mind. And this is from inside the birdhouse. I love it. Um, those blueberries actually are that big. <laughs> They're just, um, the blueberry bushes have uh, produced pretty well over the years. I have three bushes and they are in partial shade now. So uh, I like doing, again, I like doing fun, inviting, whimsical things. 
within one of the raised beds, I was going to do a bed of lettuce and we had come across this, it's a wrought iron doll bed that was just incredibly inexpensive. So I thought, oh, well, what fun. I put it in the garden. And so you see a bed of lettuce as well as some spinach growing there. And there is wildlife around. We have turtles sometimes in the garden. And I have a couple of little broken ceramic pots that are out there. Uh, they're a frog house. And I have seen a frog in one of them one time. Therefore, I'm convinced they live there. Um, carrots in the foreground, blue chair in the background. Uh, that It just stays out there through the summer. We usually take the chairs in in the winter just to prevent the wear. But here are those carrots I showed you earlier before they got washed off. Um, oh, this is, you see the window frame that's posted up right here. This is a one year where I had cucumbers in it, and you can see the surrounding annuals and perennials. See some turnips right here. Um, I also, I don't know if you can tell by looking at this, I have uh, pots that stay outdoors. They're outdoor pots in the garden. There's some blue pots there, and they're just planted with annuals, which is a lot of fun. Okay, I see some bok choy there. And it was, this is actually in a fall garden, an autumn garden. Um, here's our scarecrow again. Um, it's funny, I'm just in the process of dressing our scarecrows. They're not out there again. So it looks like he got a nice bright shirt that year. Um, he's um, holding his pitchfork out there in the squash and the tomatoes. And this is echinacea. You see bee balm in the foreground. There are nasturtiums growing also. And that is it for this presentation, except for the fact that I would really like to say thank you to Melissa at the library who just did so much with the technological end of this. I wanted to say thank you to Lyndall for keeping things going here and taking questions and just, just say a thank you to the Sewing Circle at Black Mountain Library. I want to thank the Extension Master Gardener volunteers and the programs for making this slideshow available. And I especially want to thank you for joining us. So I hope you're able to take away a few things from this and just get inspired and get out there and um, enjoy. Because remember I said planning your vegetable garden is such an important part of the process. Um, your garden through the produce will will nourish your body, but the garden itself just nourishes your spirit and nourishes your soul. So thank you.